if you can't make a quick decision, you can't own a business. I mean, honest, honestly, you sometimes you just have to make a decision in the heat of the moment and then just make it the right decision as you move forward because- Make it work. Make it work, make it work. Whatever decision, stand by it and make it work. Sure. A lot of people don't like that. They want all of the facts and all of the data. And sometimes- Engineer, analysts, things, guys like that. Hi there. My name's Tommy Yanoulis, and I am the host of the brand new podcast, Empire Builders, Scaling Success One Location at a Time. This is a podcast dedicated to talking to the founders and the current leadership of those large multi-location brands that you see every single day where you eat and shop at. And we want to find out from these guys why this business, right? Why of all the things you could do in the world, you chose to do this. We're gonna learn what their challenges were at the beginning, what almost broke them. We're gonna learn what they're facing today. And as always, we're gonna end the show with a wonderful war story. That's one of those stories where you go, I can't believe we got through this. It was insanity, you know? And hopefully they always end with a nice little laugh. So I can't tell you how excited I am to bring you these interviews with these amazing guests and just stoke that entrepreneurial flame that we all have to learn what it took to kind of get where they are today and how they got successful. So thank you for joining us. And I look forward to sharing these wonderful interviews with you. Hey there, everybody. It's Tommy. And welcome back to another episode of Empire Builders. I'm super excited to have a new guest today. Please welcome to the show, Cindy Rayfield. Cindy, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me on. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for taking the time today. So, Cindy, we do sort of the same question set up on all of our episodes. Question number one for you is, Tell us about your current business or businesses and sort of tell us about your businesses too. So what your role is and then what your companies are. Sure. So right now I have three businesses. My husband and I have three businesses. I, I'm the face of all of them, actually. Um, I own children's hair salons, which are franchises called Cookie Cutters Haircuts for Kids. I own two locations in the Denver metro area with, a, with rights to a third. Um, I also own a vending machine route, which a lot of people don't always think of in terms of franchising. It's not really a franchise, but it has franchise properties. And so uh, we do have several machines in the Denver metro area as well that we service. Um, it's more of a family venture. And then the, the one that has given me the most amount of experience in the franchise world, the most amount of exposure in the franchising world is my role as a franchise consultant. So I have a consulting practice where I help other people find franchises that fit them. So a lot of people don't even know that there's people like me around, but I'm sort of like a real estate agent for franchises. So that's my background in the franchising world. I, I did own another franchise before called, um, or actually it was a publication franchise where I, I publish magazines in high-end neighborhoods. So I've got some ad sales background. So done a lot of different things over the last 25 to 30 years because I'm just a terrible employee <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah. I think a lot of franchisees are like, ah, not only do I want to work for myself, but I realize I'm not a peach to work for <laughs> or work with. Right. Right. Yeah, we had one of those <laughs> magazines in backcountry where I used to live, where they would sell local ads and then, you know, put out articles yes. about the neighborhood and do photos and all that stuff. It was cool. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting concept. It's it's rough because you do have to sell those ads. So that's yeah. that's part of the business. And you have and, and you have to find time to write the articles and do the exposés and all yes. that stuff too. So it's and I did all of those. <laughs> it's probably forty plus hours a week, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Totally. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually very curious about vending machines. Uh, I want to start there today because no one's ever really talked about vending machines on the show yet. And I have a lot of questions because obviously with the internet and IOT and now you can do credit card vending machines and all that stuff, I have a lot of questions. So tell me a little bit more about that and then we can dive a little bit deeper. I love about the vending machines. It's, it's, it's actually, there's a couple things I love about it. First of all, you get cash every day. People are buying things every day. You have to have them placed appropriately 
So you might hear people, if people are in vending machines, if they don't have it in the right location, that's probably their biggest complaint. You have to have it in a location that's going to have a lot of traction, a lot of foot traffic, and a lot of employees that actually work there. So my vending machines are in factories, which is really the last place that anybody would think that a vending machine would go. But those vending machines do the best for me in the factory settings where the employees um, have first, second, and third shifts. They get a half hour for lunch. They can't be late. They're not going to leave because they can't. They have can't be late getting back on the floor. So those are my best performing machines. Um, I've learned a lot over the last five years running our, our vending machines. Um, I've learned that it's not passive. Everybody thinks that it is, but it's really not. It doesn't have employees unless you hire someone to help you fill them. The machines are your employees, but. I really want to caution people from thinking that it's passive, that I'm only going to, oh, great, I can just go in on the weekends. If you're only filling them one time a week, then it's not doing well. So all of my machines, we fill three, three, sometimes four times a week. So that's why it's not passive, because you do have to fill them. You do have to shop. You do have to manage and organize your back rooms. So you really have to understand going in that um, it's going to be like having another job, but you don't have a lot of employees to manage. That's probably one of the biggest um, advantages to it. So what kind of stuff are you selling on the vending machine? Like food, sodas, like water, whatever? All of the above. Uh, the best products that sell are drinks, always. Drinks sell the best. They sell the fastest. And if you know which drinks are your, um, every machine has a personality. So if you know which drinks people are going to be buying from that machine, maybe you're going to be stocking with three rows of, of a certain drink. Um, my machines, we would love to say that people buy healthy. I have a selection of healthy things. Um, mostly it's not healthy, um, which I think sometimes you know, for people who want to be healthy, they like the idea of, of providing healthy foods for people. But if nobody's buying from your, from your machines, then there's just really no purpose to it. So I have healthy options, but honestly, the things that sell the most aren't going to be sodas. But yeah. I have snacks of all kinds. I'm, I have snacks that tend to be on the healthier side. I, have, I sell beef jerky. Um, we sell some fresh items. We sell some burritos. So sure. whatever um, the, the people will buy, I will put in. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, a, I mean, obviously, like all business, it's an ROI thing. But for you, it's a very tangible ROI thing because it's like, okay, I see what's moving, you know? Yes. And it's like, yeah. it, but it's also nice because you get instant feedback, right? Like, okay, oh, hey, hey, we put right. eight sandwiches in there and then we threw six of them away. So guess what? Yeah. We're, so we're going to go yeah, replace Yeah, that's my market research. <laughs> yeah. So it's really easy. And it can all be run from this thing right here. So I can actually go in and see real time what people are buying. Um, and that makes it easy for me to refill the machines too. That was my next question is with all the technology, obviously you can do tap or credit card, which is nice. I yeah. do feel like that's sort of wonky on some machines. Like I tried to do that in a couple of places and I get off frustrated because it doesn't like want to take my card. And then, you know, something I struggled with that like recently at a soccer game, but yeah. Also, Get all the real-time inventory and alerts so do you get like a, like a push notification every time someone buys something and then can you look at the stock level so that when you go out to the machine you're not carrying everything in your van you're literally yes. going hey, to restock five bags of cheetos and you know 50 of these or whatever i know exactly what to bring because i can see it on my phone and i do get push, push notifications i get a notification when uh, my daughter, who's my employee, when she opens the machine and when she closes the machine so that I can make sure that it's sealed, that it's that it's shut. Yep. Um, I, I can set notifications for pretty much anything. And I used to play around with that where I would get all these notifications. Yeah. And I'm like, OK, I don't need to see that. So I kind of pick and choose the notifications that I want. Notifications are the greatest and worst thing ever made. Because Truly. <laughs> they're, they become noise if you don't set them correctly. And so then everyone ignores them and then things get missed. Right. So it, right. it is this thing where you have to really manage that. And we have a, our, my company and we have a checklist platform that we use to like, you know, manage daily operations for businesses and just make sure people are following all the steps. Right. So like, for instance, if your daughter didn't shut the machine correctly, then and she leaves, then, you know, either someone could break in or now she has to drive back. Right. So it's right. like, okay, do this did you do that did you check this did you check that because multi-step processes get to be a lot but we find that everybody wants a million notifications on day one and then within a week they're like shut these off 
Yeah, we can't deal with too much. Yeah. yeah. So then I have another question. So do you, what would you say the percentage of cash to credit card transactions are you seeing? And it's probably um, about it's on machine, right? Yeah, it depends on the machine, but I will say most of them are credit cards. I get a credit card dump of my uh, transactions once a week uh, on Fridays in my bank account. Um, and then I'll go to the machine and we'll, we'll grab a wad of cash out of there. It's mostly ones. It looks like a lot of money, but it's not. I would say it's probably uh, two thirds credit cards, one third cash. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. And I go to the bank. You know, I have to go to the bank and take my cash in. Sometimes I just let it pile up for a little while until yeah. it makes sense to go to the bank. But because it is mostly ones. And I walk yeah. in the bank and people are like, oh, look at all that money. It's like, well, you know, it's only $300 here. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you have deals? Do you get all your stuff at Costco or do you have deals with like, are you getting full pricing on chips and, and some of these things from like uh, Cisco or something? I do a little bit of both. Mostly it's Costco and Sam's Club, but I right. do have vendor relationships set up. So the beauty of being a business owner is you get a tax identification number and then you're able to set up vendor accounts. If there's something really specific that people like, uh, sure. I can set up a vendor account. Um, with Cisco or Pepsi or Coke directly. So I've got all, all sorts of freedom on that. Oh, cool. How many machines do you own? We own six right now. Um, we're looking to add on to that. My, my husband still works his corporate job. So one of the plans is uh, when we decide to expand it, uh, he decides to leave his job, then we're going to take some, some of the funds that we have saved aside, set aside to buy some more machines and get them set up in locations and that location is the key on that you have to have it in the right location or otherwise it's just a big piece of machinery sitting there taking up space yeah i'm wasting money because you so high i mean how much yes. is this i'm just curious uh anywhere it depends on how many you buy because these are machines because i'm a, a, a franchise consultant i actually have um they're part of my inventory so the more machines you buy the less they cost individually so if you buy the minimum amount which is four to six machines it runs around ten thousand dollars ten thousand dollars each so it sounds really expensive but man these are super fancy machines they look amazing they look sure. amazing well and i mean you know if you're thinking like like if you were trying to almost like you're franchising yourself right but like right the thing is are you you can go spend that money on a rental on on a rented space building that out for or a franchise fee or you could put that money directly into the machines right like you, the key is you're gonna have to go knock on doors and you're gonna go find the right person at this office park and be like can i put a machine in here and you know and i'm sure that you know i'm sure it's one of those things too with machines it's like the only time a machine gets kicked out of a building is when the supplier isn't keeping it full and people start complaining but once Absolutely. you get there, you're in there like no one there's no impetus to move especially if you're being really responsive to you know the requests of the, the customers right right and you keep it clean and you make it look nice and yeah. it's, it's still a relationship at the end of the day i chat with people when i'm in there they're coming into the break room they're chatting with me they ask me questions they yeah. make requests and i just you know use my customer service skills and people yeah. like it. it makes them feel good totally well cool i learned i just learned a ton about machines let's talk okay <laughs> so that's your one business let's talk about your hair salons for a second um yeah you have two of those with an option to buy a third are you going to execute your option i probably will however and you probably know this you know, in the Denver market, it can be tough. And yeah. it's tough finding real estate space and reasonably priced real estate. So yeah. that's probably been my biggest challenge. Um, I, we're going to get to the challenges later, I'm sure. But uh, what I do love about what I, so when I bought my, my stores, first of all, these are hair salons specifically geared toward kids. It's children's hair salons. So about the, the time they're about 10, 11, 12, they start going to the barber shop with dad or the hair salon with mom. But I've got those kids for a solid 10 years from yep. baby's first haircut through the toddler phase, through back to school time, through the summer cuts, whatever. I've got them pretty much. If we're doing a good job. I've got them for 10 years. So, I mean, that's that to me, that's super cool. I mean, I don't, Orange Theory Fitness, I don't know if they would say that they have their recurring clients for 10 years. Maybe they do. Maybe they do. But I feel like 10 years is a good solid time to have clients. Sure. So um, 
that's why we focus on that. And kids always need haircuts. And moms aren't going to give the cuts themselves. Sometimes they do. I'm not going to say that it never happens. But they bring their kids in for the cuts that they need. And so we have a location in Lakewood. I actually bought that one. So sometimes when people think about buying businesses, one of the things they don't think about when buying somebody else's business is that there's a whole bunch of franchises out there that people sell to. So yeah. I bought somebody else's franchise. So I did a resale at the same time as investing in a franchise. And this is after a period of being in the franchising world for a while. So I did the homework on that. Bought location number one. She was only 18 months in. Honestly, she was probably starting to run out of cash. It took a little bit more than what she thought it would because it's the one thing that franchisees always run into um, is the need for capital. You have to have you have to be well capitalized to keep the thing running. We can't predict the future. I don't have a crystal ball for me. I don't have a crystal ball for my clients. You you have to go in knowing that if you follow the system and you do what needs to be done. You have to have faith, sort of like having faith along the way that this is going to work out. I know people need haircuts. I know I can pay this rent and make payroll with the business that we have now. So that's why we bought that one. Um, I did have to put a lot of marketing dollars into it because when you have a retail location, the three biggest expenses are going to be rent, payroll, and marketing. And if you don't have the money to cover those three things, kind of like a three-legged stool, you got to have that to make a retail location run. So after about um, 18 months of running the first location, turning that big ship around to where we had consistent flow, uh, my husband and I decided it was time to open location number two. So we opened our location in Highlands Ranch, actually, a university and county line in the Target Shopping Center. If you know where that is, Tommy, it's out there. Five um, minutes yeah, yeah. So we're two doors down. There's a hand in stone, hand in stone next to us. Um, there's a, a kid's uh, cooking school next to us. Yep. It's a really great location for families. So that's location number two. And you learn a lot at opening in your second location. I learned a ton. I learned how to save money. I learned how to hire people. I learned where my best marketing bucks were going to go. Um, I really learned how to do things on a shoestring budget because the whole key is to, when you start scaling this, is spending the least amount of, amount of money up front to make the most amount of money on the back end. Um, so, I, I mean, I just learned how to do it. I actually bought another salon location that had gone out of business. So that saved me a ton of money. And that's I mean, it's really those the little things that you learn. So finding that real estate for location number three is going to be pretty critical because I actually want to find another salon location. Um, it needs to be in the right space. It needs to be 30 minutes from either one of my other stores to keep from cannibalizing my clients. So there's criteria that I have to set up to find that right spot uh, to go into. But yeah, that's what we do. And, and you know, it's, I don't cut hair. I don't, I'm not a hairstylist. The nice thing about what I do is it's considered one of those semi-absentee. Now, it does take a lot of time. I, as a consultant, I want people to understand semi-absentee doesn't mean that you're never there. Um, I, I do bring stuff to the store. I, I, I make payroll. I make rent. Um, I pay the bills. I work with my manager. I do have a uh, general manager who runs both of my stores. So that really helps to shelter me from the day-to-day -day things that can happen. She handles customer issues. She handles employee issues. And then I handle some of the bigger ticket items. So yeah, that's kind of how it works. Yeah, I, I would suggest that like the lesson for everybody that um, Cindy just said that's so true is don't build, try to buy something that's already existing in your space. People, what most franchisees don't understand is they get all excited, they get an SVA loan, they buy this franchise agreement, and then they don't realize like like kind of like the person who had your the, their first salon previous to you that person was the one that was responsible to build and convert that place into your business. And I, we have young kids. So I remember going to those types of hairstyle places. You have different types of chairs. They don't have the normal chairs. You usually yep. have like fun cars or like, you know, whatever. And so that person spent potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Building out and that's why they ran out of money 18 months later. It's because the debt service on that build out, was taking up a huge, and then rent on top of that, those two line items, probably labor next, but potentially just depending on how much labor it was, 
those those could have been five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month. You don't know, right? And so right. like so like always try, I mean, just you don't get extra points in the world for spending all your money on your build out and making you stuff. Really like you don't. You know? You don't get brownie points for that. You really yeah, don't. They're, yeah, they're, no one's gonna award you for hey, you spent seven hundred thousand dollars building out this business. Like you you wanna spend fifty thousand dollars, you know, or whatever. You wanna spend as little as possible. So that because that every penny you save on the build out or every penny you save on like the renovation or whatever it is, that is another that keeps you in business that much longer down yeah. the road if things are tight, right? And this is a tight economy. Granted, people are gonna have to get haircuts, but you know what I mean? Like it's just you have to look at it that way. Money is oxygen for a business. And if you spend up front, you're toast on the back end. My franchisor told me that too. I mean, to his credit, I some the name of my franchise is Cookie Cutters Haircuts for Kids. And our CEO, Neil, um, when I was looking for location number two, I brought several locations to his attention. And um, this particular loca location was a children's hair salon. So I, I told him, I said, Oh, Neil, I don't know. This feels like bad juju for me, you know, yeah. going into this. And he said, No, 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 no. He said, You never look at it that way. You never look at it that way. You look at what they've done that you can capitalize on that's already in place. He said, you save money on the front end. That's how franchising makes, multi-unit franchising makes the most sense. Yeah, I think that's great. And it's great that they said that because, you know, there's a lot of franchisors out there that they're just looking to get people open and they don't care because it's not their business, right? It's, so, it's true. A lot of shady dudes out there that will just oh yeah this is a great location let's just get this done because i get paid when you open right i get right. my commission when you open your doors and you got to watch and those guys exist and they're not easy to pick out well they are easy to pick out by their actions when you're dealing with them but you don't know no one's going to say oh yeah my guys are just going to get you open so you can fail right like the whole point is like and i, I say this in all the episodes but it's very true all of you're ultimately the business owner you bought a concept you bought marketing you bought uh, you know, access to a pos that's already set up and all these things but it's your name on that sba loan it's right. your name on the lease it's your bankruptcy that's coming so you have to push back you have to if things don't feel right about something don't do it don't be pressured into stuff because you have this is you ultimately these guys if you succumb to what they do and then you fail, you're the one that failed. You owe hundreds of thousands of dollars. They don't. So you just got to push back. And it's cool that that guy said that because he obviously means that he cares about his franchisees and he wants you to be successful. Well, here is the one thing in franchising. No franchisor wants to show a failure on their FDD. Yeah. They don't want to. Um, now, I'm not saying that all franchisors are great and wonderful because we know that's not true. I've known that from my experience in the franchise world the ones with longevity and there's a lot of them out there a lot of the name brands they've experienced all the growth phases all of those things and a lot of their employees who are working with the franchisees that they've gone through these things so they have that longevity uh, the there's brands that come in we call them emerging brands and, and emerging brands typically are the ones where look they don't know enough about the getting the wrong franchisee in place they want franchisee number one that franchisee yeah, yeah. number one, maybe, and most likely is not their ideal franchisee, but they don't know because they have to get franchises open. So it's a catch yeah, 22 yeah. for the franchisee and the franchisor when they're an emerging brand. The franchisor is gonna learn a lot as they sell franchises to maybe not the ideal franchisee, but you know, for those franchisees, they may have put their, you know, their whole life on the line, their, their life savings. On the line so it's really important to do your due diligence and you got to understand what your risk tolerance is because i've also seen people that once they get uncomfortable they shut down i've had i've seen it with clients before like that is the time when you cannot shut down that is the time when you have to like man take every ounce of this because it's going to be uncomfortable no matter what you do it was uncomfortable when i took over that store in lakewood it was literally walking in the door saying hey i'm your new owner now and having all the employees go what's going on here it was that happens that's uncomfortable yeah, that yeah. is and i lost employees which i knew was going to happen but you know the, that's discomfort and nobody wants to feel it but 
on the other side of the discomfort is where you see tremendous reward. But you have to get through the discomfort. But a lot of people aren't willing to do that. But that's that that's not just in franchising. That's in business ownership. Yeah. Period. Yeah. And, and it's so funny you said that shut down thing because in 2008, I had a job in business and my job was franchise assistance program manager. And this is during the 2008 collapse. It's when Quiznos started to collapse. And my job was to try to help people save their businesses, which I was not successful in doing in any way, shape or form. But it was very, one of the interesting psychological things that I learned about working in that job was that people did shut down. Like when they started losing money, they, they didn't want to do their business anymore, but they also had told all their friends and families and they had expressed yeah. their people and they were so excited and now it was going down and they would not quit the business until they got fired right so who can fire a franchisee your your supplier your landlord or your bank those are the three people who can fire you and so these people would rack up tens of thousands fifty hundred thousand dollars of unnecessary debt just waiting for somebody to go you're done and then they would then yeah. they would just shut and move on with their day but they couldn't do it on their own because they were shut down and then like you'd be like well like i would have to get their financials because i would have to do some financial analysis try to figure out where they were and the guy'd be like oh yeah i fired my accountant like six months ago like you're yeah. still a business owner dude like so you're just like you're just going in and, like because of, you know why they fired their accountant and the accountant's not necessarily cheap but the accountant was always delivering bad news so i just don't want to hear nice. that bad Right? Like I, I, you're, you're 20 grand in debt. You're 30 grand in debt. You're 40 grand in debt. No one wants to hear that and pay for it. But like, you're like, you find your accountant. That's the last guy you fire, right? Like, oh, it's nuts. I know it's hard. And, and that's, and it is, that's a discomfort stage. And, you know, I've seen a lot of people go through, I've even seen family members go through it. And it's, it's really hard to see it. I can look back and see it from my perspective. One of the things I do with all my clients after they buy a franchise, I send them an email saying, okay, here's the things you're going to go through right now. Yeah. Sometimes you're going to hate your business, but it's like your baby. It's like your, your, you know, the new puppy that you brought home when you're saying, I'm never going to have a new puppy again because they do all these things, but you love that new puppy. So you have to treat your business with the respect it deserves and not just think, ah, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm uncomfortable. So I'm just going to go back and get a job. I've seen people do that and it's just it's disheartening to pay the loss on their business and it's like if that's what you're going to do then you're not really running your business anymore you just right. might as well shut the business down sell it do something right? right and every day a business is struggling it becomes less valuable so that's the other thing you have to remember too so if you are struggling and you just don't feel like you have it in you then you've got to get to a broker and you got to get that thing sold because yeah. every day it starts to eat it a little bit more you get that much less on the back end you know yeah and you know one of the things that I've, i think it's good advice i like to tell i like to think i give good advice is when you have a business it doesn't matter even how long it's open or how long you run it act like you're going to sell it tomorrow act like somebody has a check that they're ready to write you for a million dollars for the right price you would sell it because that makes you think differently about it how can i grow this thing so it's ready to sell how am i going to have my financials in order so that i can show somebody and hand them the, my financials pretend like you're going to sell it tomorrow that way it keeps a fire lit under you to like do your marketing um, make sure your rent's paid up make sure yeah. you're paying your employees right you have the right employees all of those things absolutely well, that was question number one. <laughs> so question number two, and I mean, you kind of touched on it, but we can do question number two on, on any of the ones that I mean, the vending machines or the franchises. What were some of your earliest challenges when you started that business? Or, or sort of working on that sense? Uh, well, for the salons, I think the, the early challenge is knowing the right amount of money to put into marketing and knowing where to put my marketing dollars uh and really know one of the, the best things that i ever learned and i i didn't even know this when i first bought my business I, well i knew it but i didn't think about it and i heard this from russell brunson you don't have a business unless you have an email list that's growing so if your if your email list isn't growing your your customer list isn't growing then your business isn't growing so i started really turning things around and understanding that 
my goal in getting new clients is to grow that email list. So now I have like an email list of 30,000, maybe 35,000 customers. There is so much value in having a customer list and I don't think people really give it enough value. So growing my list became my number one thing because it wasn't really very big at first. Uh, the first owner didn't really believe in sending emails, which is kind of crazy. So yeah. she didn't collect email addresses. And it's like that there's just no value in a list if you don't have email and addresses and phone numbers to the extent that you can get both of those. So anyway, that was that was a big challenge and then knowing how to target that list so that I got people coming in. Um, another challenge was employees, learning how to manage them. You have to remember I bought before COVID, so it felt easier to hire <laughs> before yeah. COVID. So there, I had challenges, but I didn't have extraordinary challenges until COVID hit. Um, with the vending machine, I think my biggest challenge was the fact that I did open, the, I did get those machines going during COVID. We bought them 2021. So um, getting those set up and placed in these factories, that was, that it was a challenge, but it, it wasn't an insurmountable challenge. I think there were a lot of businesses that were looking for an alternative for their employees because they needed to keep employees or attract employees and keep them. So the vending machines that were really good attracted employees and they wanted to do that for their employees. So getting them placed, but I had supply chain issues. So it was a full year before I got all six of my machines. So that was a big, that was a big thing as well. I think those are my biggest challenges getting started, getting set up in the beginning. COVID was a whole different issue for my stores. Um, I don't even know if we want to go there yet or if that's a later question. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. Well, and I, I think you, let's talk about the local store marketing piece too, because this is another thing that I think a lot of like franchisees, because you know, most franchises you pay like a, a sales percentage and then you have some sort of marketing percentage. Now, yes. uh, the national marketing, that depends a lot based on how many locations of your franchise are in your area, you know, and, and so they're supposed to do certain things, but like, obviously like Supercuts, if you're a Supercuts franchisee, they've got a hundred million, uh, however many thousands of Supercuts, they actually do run national ads and, and stuff like yes. that. A lot of these smaller brands aren't going to run national ads for you, right? And you, you're paying this marketing money and but what they should be doing for you is helping you with software or helping you do maybe coupon drops in the paper. And and obviously like, I know there was like this gentleman's haircut place that was around that I went to for a while. And like they had four or five locations in Denver. So they were trying to get to like 10 or 15 locations before they would start doing coupon drops like with the Denver Post or, you know, those mailers. So they, they were paying all this money into marketing. They didn't necessarily feel like they were always getting a benefit to that. But at the same time, it does it once again, it goes back to you. You're in charge of your business. So you have to be doing things because that's double go. Well, I pay four percent to marketing. Okay. Well, and you know, the fees get adjusted, whatever. But like, oh yeah, that's great. That that's just something you did you signed on to do, but you you have to put 10, 15 percent into your own marketing because once again, it's your business. Like oh yes. well, yeah, the franchise or is not doing all the marketing. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like you still have to do marketing every day. Like get the email list. Email list is probably the greatest asset you can have because email is relative is free essentially. Right. 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 Absolutely. Well, and, other and that, value, that's, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tommy. I was going to say the other value of the email list is local store marketing through Facebook and Instagram, because if you have those emails, you can do the most targeted. Yes. Targeted ads to just the people in your area and they, if you have a hundred email addresses, it, uh, Facebook will find you a million people. Like yeah. uh, look alike, look alike it's lists. A, yeah, insanity. It's amazing. Well, and this is true. I mean, one of the things that people that they think, I think, when they when they buy a franchise, and part of my work with my clients is educating them that part of their money is going to go to the advertising fund. So that means I never have to do any of my own advertising, and that is just not true. That part of that money, like in my case, I pay 1% um, marketing, 1% of my royalty, my monthly royalties goes towards national marketing. That covers sure. our website, um, website maintenance, and they also post all of our social media for us. Now, I post additional social media, but honestly, if I had to put together all of the graphics and the wording and everything that they put, to, I'd have to pay somebody a yeah. lot more than that 1% to do that for me at a local level. 
So, I mean, to me, that was just having them do my social media. They'll do my Facebook, my Instagram. Um, a lot of it's automated. I mean, I totally yeah. understand that they have to do that. Instagram, um, Facebook, uh, they do some of my Google page. Um, what's another one that I'm thinking? Um, it's really mostly where we are because cookie cat, the, the moms are on Facebook. Yeah. So that's most of it is. So we don't do any TikTok. And there's been people who want to do a TikTok strategy and the franchisor hasn't gotten there yet. That may be something that they do later on. But that's the nice thing. If you think about what what you're paying, it should definitely be giving you some value back. You can't just assume, but it's not enough. I mean, I have to put in my own money for my local Google ads, for my own Facebook advertising. That's mine. That's me. I have to determine what's going to make good sense. If I want to do a postcard, they can they have the graphics for me, but I'm going to have to pay for the list and putting it out into the 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 local area, the postage. Uh, yeah, we don't do we don't do TV advertising. It's sure. just not something that we do. Um, some franchises, if you're big enough, like you got Hand in Stone, Hands in, Hand in Stone does it. Like you said, Supercuts, Supercuts can back the you know the MLB. So or or Floyd's. I think Floyd's is now the you know hair salon of the MLB. So sure. you know those things that they can do because they've got the money to do it. Um, over time, they've acquired that. I don't think Cookie Cutters Haircuts for Kids is ever going to do anything at a national level other than have a website that they maintain um, and then giving local guidance to us. And I'm okay with that and doing our social media. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with yeah. that. And 1% is totally reasonable in that scenario, right? Like right. I was, the 1% I was saying was like a Quiznos number from back in the day, but they also had thousands of locations at that time. And so they were yes. doing that. And I'm sure that Supercuts has a higher number than cookie than your brand because oh, yeah. they are sponsoring a NASCAR and they're doing all these other things, but they are doing that national exposure stuff. And and actually one percent seems reasonable to me. Like I don't right. I would look at that. Oh, that's fine. But what they're doing, one percent's totally cool. They were trying to get four or five percent, but nah, that's a little bit much, right? Considering you're not yeah. doing all of the other things but that's really great and these are but, all the things that are in the fdd that people really and i if i can say one thing people have to do their research um because it's there it's listed you just have to know what's reasonable um and and they'll tell you in the fdd too i've got a lot of franchises in fact most of them are going to say we do one percent national ad branding some of them actually have a requirement in their fdd of the percentage that the franchisees have to pay on a monthly basis to do their marketing. There are some franchises that have actually taken marketing completely off the franchisee's plate. They take it all in house, but you're paying for it still. So you have to be aware of what's in the FDD. You know, and, it's, it's all written. And that is the value. And why don't you explain that a little bit too, real quick about your consulting business? Cause don't you get paid by the friend, you get paid for the referral of bringing the person in. So you're yes. literally working for you're trying to find the person the best possible franchise your client the best possible franchise for them but they don't have to pay you directly right correct correct i get paid by the franchisor so that's why i say i'm sort of like a real estate agent for franchises i mean we operate different i'm not a friend i'm not a real estate agent but the franchisor i have about a thousand franchises that i represent in my inventory there are some that i would Re um, recommend in a heartbeat and then there's others that I know nothing about and I couldn't in good conscience recommend them because I just don't know enough about them and then I've had I have had bad experiences with franchisors I know it sounds crazy because considering that they pay our bill but there's been instances where I'm thinking gosh I can't ever in good conscience show that to one of my clients I don't like this I don't like this I'm having a hard time with a franchise rep so I don't show them because at the end of the day I get clients I hate that cliche, by the way, end of the day, I have to back away from using that. I get my clients through relationships. So yep. I've been, because I've been doing this for 15 years, I have a lot of military people that are my clientele. I speak at the Air Force Academy. Uh, my client list, I have a lot of clients that refer people to me. Um, I go do networking. Um, I do work with the small business uh, development centers, the score offices. Because I have those relationships, I can't just be willy-nilly like throw slapping out franchises that don't fit people 
it's my reputation on the line. I'm here in my community, so I see people at networking events. Um, I work all over the country, but the bulk of my work comes from my local area because, again, it's a relationship business. So it's really important to find that right fit. And I also know my numbers. I'm a salesperson at the end of the day as well, and it's really important to understand what the numbers are. In reality, I have to talk with probably 400 people a year to funnel down to where I'm, I'm actually selling or helping people buy maybe 10 franchises in a year. So the number of people that I have to talk to is so much greater than the people who are actually going to buy. My closing ratio when people really start getting serious is maybe one in five, one in six people. Most of the people that I work with go back and get a job. Once they see what's going on, they learn, they learn a ton, they get their, their, their franchise MBA, and then they find out, hey, that's not really what I wanted. But I couldn't do what I do if I didn't talk to so many people and know that the great majority of them are not going to buy a franchise at the end of the day. They're just not going to do it. Or they might come back to me later. But in reality, I just have to know what my odds are. I have to find that diamond in the rough. I have to find that person with the right risk tolerance. I have to find that person with the right funds set aside um, if they're going to match with one of my franchises. So really, they're, they're putting a lot of trust in me to find them and create a list for them of franchises that are going to fit. I, I like to surprise them sometimes uh, with things that they wouldn't think of for themselves because that's fun. But they, they put a lot of trust in me and knowing that they're going to do the research. I can't do the research for them. Nobody can do the research for them. They're writing the check. They have to do the research. I'll introduce it. And I do get paid by the franchise or only if they buy, but they have to do the research. So I, I answer questions for them along the way too. And because I'm a franchisee, I can answer questions with, you know, a lot of experience behind it. Well, and the reality is too, this is probably even more than your house, the biggest purchase yes. that you're ever going to make. So I could see that a lot of people go down the path and then they realize, oh, wait a second. I maybe don't have the personality type for this, or, or I don't right. have the amount of money I'm going to need for this. Or they get educated very quickly and they go, okay, I got to pump the brakes here for a little bit because I can't do this right now. Because the other right. thing is just super analytical people who, who need so much data to make decisions. And that's not, that's not a necessarily a good business owner, right? Because they actually need to make quick, quick decisions. <laughs> If you can't make a quick decision, you can't own a business. I mean, honest, honestly, you sometimes you just have to make a decision in the heat of the moment and then just make it the right decision as you move forward because make it work, make it work, make it work, whatever decision, stand by it and make it work. Sure. A lot of people don't like that. They want all of the facts and all of the data. And sometimes it's just analysts, things, guys like that, they're, they're, they really struggle because they can't, there's not enough data. Sometimes there's no data, you know, in, 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 there's nowhere to get it. You can't Google, what should I do about this thing in my business, right? Like, you just have to go. You have to make the leap. There's a leap for as, as much information as you can get to how are you going to make that decision? There's a gap there. And you have to be able to bridge that gap with your own faith, with your own um, willingness to take that risk. And there is nobody that's going to bridge that gap but you. So. And to get that data there's no data there to get and sometimes both options are probably equal and that's even worse because now you're just going okay what do i hate doing less what's going to be easier for me you know like those are literally the factors that are playing into it because literally it's a flip of a coin right but you know right. you're like well i don't want to flip the coin but i hate that less i hate you know i'd rather go and stand on a corner with a sign than you know have to get on the computer or whatever it might be, doesn't matter. Yes. That, and that um, sometimes does make a decision for people. I hate my job so much that I'm willing to take this risk and make it work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because so many people do want to buy a franchise because they hate their boss. Yes. <laughs> they like that, all, like, all they, really, like, they don't really want to own a business. They really are in a much better position when someone's telling them what to do and gives them all the systems and everything. But they just hate their boss so much. That they're like, I got to get out of here and start my own business. And yeah. uh, you're like, no. The, the, it's not always a good reason to do it. That's yeah. why the research is so important. Well, it's like funny that they don't go, well, I'll just go find a different job somewhere else. <laughs> right? Like, 
my boss isn't going to go with me to my new company, I don't think. <laughs> so many people have bad bosses, I guess, after 20 bad bosses in a row, you're like, right. Okay. Yeah, they start, or if they have to travel a lot. So many people have uprooted their families. And I've, I've had clients that have actually bought a business because they've been uprooted so many times. And then the last time they got uprooted and they moved wherever they are, they got laid off. So they yeah. just uprooted their family only to get laid off. And now they're like, I'm just, I can never go back to that. Yeah. And I, I feel I mean, their pain. Oh, absolutely. And traveling for business. Yeah. That's yeah, just the worst. Um, yeah. Okay, so question number uh, four, which is what are some of the challenges you're facing right now? Just because, yeah. Yeah, well, I can go into that. <laughs> and this has been since COVID. I mean, you have to remember uh, hair salons during COVID had to shut down. So uh, everywhere across the United States, we had to shut down for anywhere from maybe six weeks to I think places in California, maybe a year or more. They That's couldn't crazy. open, you know, I mean, that there's nothing more devastating than that. But what COVID did is it sort of changed the landscape. And I can't say that it was all bad. What COVID made me really good at, and my staff, my manager and my staff is getting really good at efficiencies. We always have done 15 minute haircuts on our kids, on, on kids that come in. Um, but my staff that I had before COVID was like, well, if we take 30, then it's okay. And it seems really great. But when you start saying, well, that's, 50% of capacity, that's a lot of money that's going out the, the window. Because the demand was so high after COVID, we had to do 15 minute cuts and everybody had to get comfortable with doing 15 minute cuts. It made us so much more efficient. So that was a great thing. But the challenge that I'm still facing four years later, which I've, I've always told people it's very much like a golf swing or a putt actually. So when you're putting, you pull back a little bit, but your follow through is a lot longer. That's how COVID is. We had this this period here, but our recover period is going to recovery period is going to be this long. We're still we're four years in, and we're still seeing challenges from COVID. Hiring, hiring employees, finding employees that want to come to work because once they got that taste of being at home, so many people, even hairstylists, you you can't cut hair from home. You yeah. have to go into the salon and cut hair. And so many people just didn't want to do that. And so a lot of stylists left the industry. They simply left. They went and found other things. Now, you can make really good money as a hairstylist. Base base pay, tips, tips. Sometimes you're making more per hour in tips than you are in base pay. Retail, sales, commissions, uh, bonuses. They can end up making, you know, $45 to $50 an hour when they're working for me. But it's work. You have to be there. You have to yeah. do it. And finding people that want to do that has been kind of a challenge. It's just a different environment. It's a different mentality. It's a different thought process. And so I've really had to learn how to be okay with people lasting maybe not as long as I would like them to last. I do my very best. I pay top dollar in the salon industry, but it's really hard sometimes to find that person who's willing to um, stick it out. They, there's, they don't have them. Uh, I hate to say this. I don't want to sound like an old person. Oh, those youngsters, they just don't have the mental capacity. <laughs> but it's what I've, it's, they don't have the same work ethic that I would like them to have. But that's just, I have to get, I have to get comfortable with that. It's sure. a different world. That's probably been my biggest challenge, honestly. I would also say I've not experienced this, but I know some of my clients have. The rent my rent has stayed the same i've been able to negotiate my rent with the help of my franchisor to keep my rent the same but there was this philosophy in covid which i didn't agree with there was a lot of franchisors that were saying perfect timing to buy a franchise because now you're going to get to negotiate with the landlords and you're going to get these special breaks and they're going to want to rent to you that was not true i didn't think it was true then and it's definitely not true now just because Everybody thought that the the, fran the um, landlords were going to suddenly be desperate enough to offer all these incentives doesn't make it true. It was not true. In fact, it's been just the opposite. Rents have gone sky high. There's not as much, there's not as many PI dollars out there um, for build out. So things have changed in the commercial landscape. And I don't, I don't, um, I don't know how that's going to, I can't predict the future. 
But for people thinking that it was going to be this way, it really wasn't. And we don't see any signs of change in that area right now. And marketing has gone up considerably. The, I, what I used to pay for Google ads, I used to get thousands of responses on my Google ads. I have to pay a whole lot more and I'm getting a whole lot less response on my Google ads, which I'm still trying to figure out. And Google ads is very complex, which is probably my biggest complaint right now. So yeah. those are some of the challenges that I've, that I'm facing now. My vending machines, my challenges are my food costs go up and people will be like, hey, why are those donuts two twenty five when they used to be, you know, $1.50? Well, you know, I, I have to pay more. And th there's a thought process that I should only be charging for my donuts what I paid for my donuts. Like, that is not how this works. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, you know, food costs in general is through the roof right now, right? And it's interesting you said that about the salons because going back to the salons real quick, the restaurant industry during COVID went through what they, they call like the grand exodus, right? Where every yes. season managers, chefs, season waiters, season employees across the entire industry just said, you know what? I'm going to go drive Uber. Which, by the yes. way, Elon Musk's, I mean, Elon Musk Robo Taxi, Uber's going away, people. Lyft's going away. Yeah, it but, is. It's going to look different here in probably five years. Yeah, I mean, I think you'll still get your Instacart people. You'll still have like uh, delivery, food delivery, because you have to have a physical person walking your place, but not necessarily because uh, in the future, a Robo Taxi will drive up to your restaurant, a text message will go out, some of them, the staff will bring the food, put it in the Robo Taxi, and it'll move on. So, like, Uber, which sucked away so many employees from all of these hourly jobs, is going, they're all going to have to start coming back because, like, automated driving is basically here now. And that's what, right. by the way, Uber and Lyft and all these companies have been waiting for. They've been taking all this private equity money, just waiting, waiting, waiting until they get the day where they get the most expensive part yeah. out of there driver right so because they're still not profitable <laughs> yeah but they will be as soon as they don't have to pay drivers they'll be making a fortune right so yeah but like there was a great exodus and, and i mean i work from home and i've worked from home from 2009 but i've owned two tech companies that were small so it's not like you know i wasn't like you know a chef saying hey i'll just cook all the food from home and bring it to the restaurant I'm like that's amazing right but i'm like unique in that respect but most people I think are realizing that you need to kind of go back to work and if you want to make money you know then that's where you're going to have to be because a lot of these jobs that people have been able to work from home from covid the technology is coming in so fast right now these jobs are going to start going away, gonna go away right? so you, you better you're, yeah you're going to have to go back and cut hair instead of doing customer service on your couch because literally like the ai is so good now it can handle so much of the customer service like yeah. yeah there's just a lot of these jobs that people have today are going to start just going away because of just the rapid onset of technology and so i think it is going to push a lot of people back into the workforce and then are going to have they're, to they're reluctant yeah. they are so reluctant it's like kicking and screaming to get people yeah. back but it's going to have to happen you can't right now you can't have a computer cut your hair. Yeah. Um, listen, I'd invest in that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Those, uh, I'd get three of those uh, Optimus robots if they could cut hair and just let them go to town, right? <laughs> yep, 100%. Oh, man. That'd be but, you know, that's probably our biggest challenge right there. I mean, in staffing, and I'm sure that so many people say this, in franchising and, and even in regular businesses, it's staffing is probably the biggest thing right now. Yep. So, all right. Good to know. So it's war story time. Give me a war story. Something, um, something crazy that happened. Something you can't believe you got through it. Doesn't have to be from this business. It's just anything that's good with me. Um. So this is sort of a war story. I'm not going to give away any names because yeah. it's just not what I do. But I had one of my clients who bought a restaurant brand, and they were getting ready to sign the lease on a location. And the franchisor, who is actually very well known among his circles, and he has a lot of friends, and he's very well connected. The franchisor, the owner, the one who started the, the brand, actually went behind. <laughs> it's terrible. This is, I, I, I'd say this to point out that not all franchises are great. And this is a good brand. I actually really like this brand. I actually eat at this brand. But when I found this out, I just couldn't do it anymore. He went behind my client's back 
talk to one of his friends to actually get the lease away from my clients. My clients had negotiated the lease for this spot. What a and girl. oh, it was so bad. And I was so angry about it. This is an example of why I say that I even have my beef with franchises that I represent that are in my inventory because I work for a big group. So I, it's not like I've gone out and acquired all these thousand franchises. I work for a big brokerage group that actually maintains the invest the inventory list. So I didn't negotiate all of these deals, but this is an example of not all franchises are perfect. Not all yeah. franchises are good, and not all of them have the best the client their their franchisee's best interest at heart. So when my client told me this, I I just I went to the ballistic and I went to the top and I I told everybody and. I actually um, gave this franchise a bad review on on a franchise page, a specific franchise page, and I really I'm not one I'm not one to go out and give bad reviews, sure. uh, but in this case I felt it was necessary. I I had to warn other people. It's like you cannot have a, an owner CEO level doing things like this to sabotage the franchisees because they got friends. It's just not cool. It's just it's yeah and lawsuit ensued rightly so so those are the things that can happen and but it's very important that people do their homework and you know i don't want to say oh yeah you have to work with a franchise consultant you don't have to this doesn't there's it's it doesn't require it but we just have access to more information than other people we have a lot more experience um most franchise consultants that i know not all of them but a lot of them own businesses themselves so again, we tend to speak from experience when we're talking about these things, which I think is valuable because I can give war stories. I can tell people, hey, that's a red flag. You shouldn't do that. Or when somebody tells me, oh, well, the franchisor asked for this. They did what? Why would they ask for, why would they do a credit pull? You know, the little things, the little red flags. Like, yeah, they shouldn't be asking for, there should be no credit pull. It shouldn't be happening yet. It's too early. So I'm able to give them some insight into things like that, which I don't know. I'm not perfect, but I'd like to say that I really do try very much to have my clients' best interest at heart and find them something that's going to fit them because that's the key. It, like I don't cut hair. I ne would have never thought that a, a franchise where I'm running a hair salon is going to fit me, but it absolutely fits me. Look, I don't have to. These aren't my little kids, but I tell you, when I walk in that store and I see these little kids running around with fabulous haircuts, all I have to do is go up to their mom and say, oh, he looks so cute. And we are heroes when the owner comes up and says something like, your child is just a beautiful child. they got gray hair. They're so cute. We're heroes. And that's really, I love being a hero to my clients. Well, and outside, one little thought on there. Just remember, if you're buying a franchise, you are dealing with uh, a timeshare salesman like they're essentially the same level of sales efficacy yes. timeshare salesman they are there to close very large deals and it's a very specific salesperson who can close a 50 100 250 thousand dollar deal within with a customer not in the business to business world and so these guys are slick and they they're they read you and they 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 are high commission business and they make a lot of money every time someone buys a franchise not when they're successful operating a franchise when they buy a franchise so just you know avail yourself of help in this because they are going to tell you exactly what you want to hear and how great it is and they're going to show you the one store that they got somewhere that's doing 10x what everybody else does and blah 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 blah, blah. and they're going to get you into real estate that might not be the best just to get the deal done because they don't get paid until you open the store so they, that's their motivation. So just having a consultant like yourself who can see some of these things unfolding and going, why would they put you in the back of a strip center? Who cares if the rent's 200 bucks? You know, no one's ever going to go, you know, like having somebody that can help you in truly probably the biggest expense of your life, much more so than your home, because it has the potential to bankrupt you or your home just hopefully just stay the same, right? Like it's crazy. Well, and so, if I could add to that a little bit, Tommy, one of the things like, I, they do want to sell franchises. And I always tell people, the franchise or the person you're dealing with is a salesperson. Absolutely. That is true. Now, they're not all slick. They're not all bad. Yeah. Um, they do want to make money. This is how they get paid. What they do want to get you to is either a yes or a no, because they have franchises to fill. So if you're a no, that's okay. They're going to move on to the next one because they're trying to find, like I said, that diamond in the rough. But 
they make money initially you pay the franchise fee yes they do make money on that a lot of that has to go back out that's also considered marketing dollars so that goes back out to pay for more people to find where they make money is on the royalties over time so yeah. it's in their best interest it should be in their best interest to get those stores open and operating so you have to look really closely at units sold versus units on an open and operating and then there's also something in the franchise disclosure document that tells you how many franchises have closed they have to disclose that they don't want it they don't want to have franchises closed so i would really say they do care because they have to report it which then means that people won't buy it and over time they call it being franchise was it franchise sufficient or franchise dependent franchise independent or royalty dependent sorry i had to think about that word they they want to get to where they are more making more from their royalties than from their franchise fees the yes. only yeah. way they can do that is have successful franchisees open and operating so it's not totally their goal to just sell a franchise sell a franchise they want they do want to sell it to people who are going to stay open <laughs> and, and so, i don't I have such a I don't want to have a negative bent on this because there are a lot of great franchise ors that really do help and care just I, I go back to like your boss the, 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 the head of your franchise going hey this is a great location don't don't worry about that this is actually good like there are a lot of very consultative and good and 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 I guess really ultimately you want to pick a franchise or that wins when you win that's, that's it a good thing and so having a consultant help you figure out am I does this guy win when I win, or does this guy win in spite of me, in spite of me winning or not? That's right. Because really, that's the whole incentive-based relationship of the franchisee franchisor is I the franchise is supposed to be win wins. Yep. I'm winning, I'm doing good, and now this guy's doing good. Yeah. And as long as that's the that's the relationship that you can get into, you're gonna be successful. Because that's right, and that's where the research comes in. Yeah. Yeah, and you do something called validation. You can talk to other franchisees during your research process. Some people bypass that. I always tell my clients, don't bypass that. You need to talk with other people. And That's where you're going to get your most value. Yep. And you need to talk to the people they tell you to talk to. And then you need to go look in the yellow pages and find the guy that's in your area and go sit in their restaurant or, or business and just see what the heck's going on yeah. and introduce you yourself. You can call anyone. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, um, Cindy, it was wonderful meeting you today. Thank you so much. Do you want to uh, just throw out some URLs or some addresses? That sure. People can sure. So if you have children in the Denver metro area, now there are 200 locations across the United States, but I own the two in Denver. Um, if you have kids in the Denver metro area that need haircuts, you can look us up at haircutsarefun.com. Pretty simple URL. And you can find us. We have one in Lakewood and one in Highlands Ranch, but they're all over the United States. So, and the good news is if you buy a discount card at any location, you can use it anywhere else across the United States. So if you're traveling or whatever. So haircutsarefun.com. My company is called The Synergy Group. I'm also affiliated with Franchise Matchmakers, which is pretty simple to learn. Franchisematchmakers.com or The Synergy Group. Synergy with a C, sort of like my name. That is actually more consultative. I also help franchise, franchisors get into the broker networks i help them to craft their franchise and really build it to be a good franchise so i consult in, in issues like that i help people with funding so i do other things outside of the consulting world for helping people find a franchise but if you want to find a franchise franchisematchmakers.com is a great place to go cindy at franchisematchmakers.com cool. and if you want to know about the vending machines listen you can set up a time on my calendar just you know you can send me an email and um, I can fill you in on all things vending. I love it. It's such a great industry. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Cindy, for coming on today. Thank you guys for listening to the podcast. And we'll be back soon with uh, new interviews. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.